Hello and welcome to our week one of the Spiritual Warfare Workshop. This is going to be a four-part workshop. Tonight what we're going to be talking about is I'm going to give you a small introduction about me for those of you that don't know me and then I'm also going to talk a few minutes about why I teach about spiritual warfare and then I'm going to go into the tactics of the enemy. Week two and three will be devoted to talking about um, our weapons of warfare. I want to spend a lot of time there because that's the really good stuff. Week four will be a wrap up for anything that we haven't covered yet or for more questions and just a, um, a kind of wrapping everything up and moving forward. Now with this, the videos are going to post every Monday for, for each week of the workshop is four weeks. So on Monday, the video will post and then you will have between Monday and Thursday to watch the video and think of any questions you have, think about what it brings to mind or anything like that. And then every Thursday evening at 5.30 Central Time, which I'm, I'm in Texas, so that's my time, I will go on in the, in the ministry group in the um, spiritual warfare workshop group and do a live Q and a time where I will answer questions that have been coming in already. And then I will also answer questions that you have on the spot. If you have questions, you can message them to me throughout the week, or you can just pop on the live and ask them and I'll answer them then. So I want to jump right in. A lot of people have heard my testimony. It is posted in the spiritual warfare group. If you want to go in and listen to the extended, the whole version, you can, you can do that. I'm not going to go through the whole thing right now, but I just want to give you a brief overview of who I am so that that way you can feel like you kind of know me a little bit and you know, you kind of know where I'm coming from. So whenever I was young, about around the age of seven, my biological dad and mom had already been divorced and my biological dad married a woman. And once they got married, um, I could tell pretty quickly that things were different at his home. So he lived in Florida and my mom lived in Indiana and he had visitation every summer and every other Christmas. And that first year that I went there, he wasn't married yet because he wanted me to be there or that was part of it, there for the ceremony. And so they were getting married that summer when I went there, but they were already living together. And I could tell things were very, very different. And as time went on, I was introduced to the occult and even Satanism. Um, he was very deep into witchcraft. I don't know who introduced who. I know that she was a self-proclaimed witch. So I don't know if she introduced him um, or they both were getting into it and then they met. I, I have no idea how that worked, but they both were heavily into witchcraft and really dark things. He also... Um, was very sexually abusive toward me and my step-siblings. And it was, um, you know, more, I think, than even the sexual abuse was the, the, the him telling me that he could read my mind. And as a small child, he seemed like he was huge and big and scary. And in my world, he was. And so I fully believed that he could read my mind. So even when I would go back to Indiana after my visits were over, I can remember thinking, don't think bad, don't think bad, because I thought he could read my mind wherever I was. And if I was even thinking bad thoughts that he was going to hurt me or my mom, because he always said if I told, he would kill my mom and or me. And so I can remember just, just, I started counting, I started counting objects. Whenever I was being abused, I would count the tiles on the ceiling. And that's where OCD really was birthed. And I used counting to suppress memories, to hold them down, and even thoughts and feelings. Because of the abuse, I suffered greatly, and you know, emotionally. In school, I was very, very quiet. I was shy. I didn't have hardly any friends. I never fit in. I hated being called on for anything. If the teacher called on me, I would just, even if I knew the answer, I would say, I don't know. Because I, I did not want to talk out in front of my classmates. I didn't want to share in front of them at the chance that I was wrong. And, you know, from the outside looking in, I probably looked like a really bad, lazy student. But it was just that I never had any self-worth. And then from a young age, I started having um, eating disorder, 
where I would starve myself. That was the one thing I could control. And I also got interested in guys. I went directly from boys to being interested in men. And when I was in my early teens, I started being sexually active with men who were, uh, I was probably, I don't know, around 14. And I started getting the attention of men who were 24, 25. And at the time, it felt like I was in relationships. But looking back, I'm like, what in the world were these guys thinking? I was a child. You know, I see kids that age now and I'm just like, oh my goodness. Uh, but at the time, it felt like relationships, but it was never a real relationship because it was only centered around sexual activity. I also started cutting. I was in severe depression. I was just a mess, a, a total mess. When I was 16, I got married for the first time. That marriage was full of domestic violence. But the thing that was really good was I went to church and I gave my heart to the Lord when I was 18. I had my son and I had him in November, October. Then my birthday was in November. I turned 18 in November. Had him the month before. And then around February, I went to church for the, the first time in a long time and gave my heart to the Lord. And I've been walking with him ever since. But life didn't automatically just get better. And, you know, I think I had an idea that it would. And it didn't. And I still had major depression. I had PTSD. And I also, in my early 20s, was diagnosed with DID, which is Dissociative Identity Disorder. The idea being that whenever you suffer trauma, especially as a young child, that you can split and have different personalities living in your body. And I also had other weird things happening all the time. So I would see things moving in my, or I would see shadows. Sometimes I would see full-blown people. Like I would just see people walking through my house or I would see shadows. I would hear voices. I heard the voices in my head 24 seven because of the DID, but then I would also hear outward voices. There were times I would hear my name being called a lot. I would hear like a radio where I could pick up the background noise, but I, I couldn't hear exactly what they were saying. That happened all the time. I would hear scratching, my lights would turn off and on, sometimes my jewelry would disappear only to show back up like setting on my pillow or or setting out in the open. Um, I can remember times of driving to church and feeling the back of my seat being kicked the entire way there and kicked the entire way back. I would wake up sometimes with bruises on my body that was like handprints but not mine. I could tell physically they weren't my hands. Um, I woke up sometimes with bite marks. I woke up with scratches. I would have horrific, horrific dreams where I was being chased, raped, tormented, um, on the brink of death all the time. Horrific nightmares. I would feel a presence in my room and I would just be terrified. I couldn't sleep at night. I was scared all the time. Talk about fear. It was more like terror, complete and total terror. Well, I went on and on like that for many years. I wasn't in churches that taught about spiritual warfare, or really, you know, anything in that aspect. In probably 2019, around in that, around about that time, my son had messaged me and said, hey mom, I think this minister may, may be something that you would like to listen to. So I listened to it. And for the first time, I heard a message about deliverance meaning that uh, demons connect, can connect, even to Christians, to our mind, our will, our emotions, and our flesh. And we can have the need to shut those doors and verbally cast them out in the name of Jesus. And that they get there because of open doors, and that's some of the things that we do in our life that opens the doors to them, and just not knowing our authority and not knowing how to stand against them. And I'm not going to get deep into deliverance today. We're going to talk about that more in depth later. Um, today we're, we're talking about different topics, but just for giving my testimony, I kind of wanted to touch on that because that's a huge part of my testimony. And so after I listened to that message, I had a friend who had a prayer ministry and her and I started meeting and she started teaching me about some of those open doors. I was a huge fan of horror movies. I was a fan of like Twilight, um, the originals, all the stuff with the vampires. My husband and I loved it. And this is my, my current husband. I divorced my first husband and was remarried. Um, and we've been going on 20 plus years. We've been together for a minute. And he's a wonderful man. We'll talk about him some later too, or maybe next week. But anyway, 
we loved that. We loved Halloween because we knew the month of October would have all the scary movies. And we looked at it as just innocent entertainment. We never recognized that, oh, wait, we watch all of this horror and then we can't sleep at night because we're scared, scared. My bed would shake all night long, like literally shake, like somebody standing beside it, shaking it. And I was not connecting that to the stuff that I was watching. We also talked about like open wounds and learning to trust God. So she was a great help on my journey to getting free. But I could not see her for very long because I kept getting physically sicker and sicker and sicker and mentally sicker. So I stopped going and seeing her. And um, I lost about a year because I, I don't really know what happened. I know I got sicker. But the week of May 24th, 2020, God had told me to set aside a week for fasting and prayer. I said, okay, Lord, because at that point, I didn't know each night if I was going to wake up the next morning. I had so many physical illnesses and mental. I, there were times that I thought, you know, I'm, I'm not going to make it. I'm going to die or something's going to happen. I was being seen by the Mayo Clinic for different things, and it, it, it was really bad. And so I set aside that week. And I knew that I needed deliverance, but I didn't know to what extent. And when I say deliverance, I mean closing doors to demons and verbally casting them out in the name of Jesus and then learning to walk in that freedom. So I knew I needed that, but I didn't know to what extent. I didn't know if half of my problem was that and half was other things. You know, I, At that point, I had no idea. So I had called my parents. Or no, that's not accurate. Let me back up. So God had laid on my heart to call my parents and have them come over and pray for me. And when I say parents, I mean my mom and stepdad, but he's my dad. Like you'll hear me call him dad. When I'm talking about the abuser, I always call him biological dad. The person I call dad is, is technically my stepdad, but he's been my dad for many, many years. And so the Lord laid it on my heart to call them. And I'm like, Lord, they live so far away. Will you just, will you just call them and have, not call them, but will you lay it on their heart to come? And then it was just a few minutes later, my mom called me and said, Nicole, I feel like that your dad and I need to come over and pray for you midweek. And I'm like, yeah, I, I do too. So I had shared with them a little bit about what I was learning about deliverance. And God was taking me through a cleansing process where I was just like, like repenting and, and really cl cleansing everything that I had allowed into my life and just really healing from a lot of the deep wounds, choosing to forgive. It was a very long process. I encourage you to watch the video because I go into much more detail. The full video, it's in the group. You can find it there. Or you can find it on YouTube under my testimony on my page. It's just Nicole Henson. So they came over and four and a half hours later, they had my dad had cast between 45 and 60 demons out of my body. I was 100% completely free from mental torment. I no longer had any voices in my head. I no longer um, had de any depression, no PTSD, no OCD, no DID. It was all gone, just completely gone. It wasn't a healing. It was a, the demons were cast out and I was set free from demonic torment. So, I mean, we can call it a healing in that it's gone, but it really was a, a getting rid of the demonic torment and that was what was causing the issue it wasn't like God healed me from depression he cast a demon out through his power that was causing the depression and so pretty pretty immediately God said I gave you the blueprint to get free now go help other people and I said okay Lord you know I can do that had no idea what that meant. No, like I had no idea where all that was going. So I posted my, my testimony. People started reaching out to me. I started doing a lot of deliverance ministry. Then he started leading me into a time of teaching to where now I'm more focused on teaching, equipping, and training, not just about deliverance or spiritual warfare, but about all kinds of topics. If you go on the YouTube channel, I teach about a lot of different topics. I share a lot of different things on my personal page, our ministry group. If you're not in our ministry group, it's called Fullness of Joy Ministry. And there's another one out there that's not us. The one that is us has green flowers, like succulents at the top of the banner. That's how you can tell which one's us. And so I'm not doing one-on-one -on -one deliverance sessions anymore because God has moved me into a different season, but I'm doing a lot of teaching now, writing books and still really fun and exciting things. So that's a little bit about me. Now I want to talk about why I teach about spiritual warfare because 
I get people saying, well, you just shouldn't teach about it. You focus too much on the enemy. You're giving them too much glory. So I wanted to share with you a few scriptures. And the, the one reason, the one and only reason I teach about spiritual warfare is because we have to learn about the tactics of our enemy so we can be on guard against his tricks. And we have to learn our weapons of warfare so that we don't get beat up by him. We do not have to live defeated lives. We can walk in victory through Jesus Christ. But we have to know how to walk in that victory in order to walk in that victory. Putting our head in the sand, pretending like demons don't exist, pretending like that they're not attacking us, that doesn't work. I can tell you firsthand. Doing that, what that is like, is going into a boxing match and you don't have gloves, you don't have a mouthpiece, you don't have a headpiece, you are just standing there in the middle of the ring with your arms tied behind your back while your enemy just hits you over and over and over. Not using weapons of warfare and not understanding the enemy, that's what that's like. So Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. First Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, well-balanced and self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. That enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion fiercely hungry, sleek, seeking someone to devour. So if we're supposed to be alert and cautious at all times, we have to know what we're alert and cautious against. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural places. So we are told to put on armor because we're in a battle against demons. Not flesh and blood, but demons. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11 says, If you forgive anyone anything, I too forgive that one. And what I have forgiven, I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of and with the approval of Christ, to keep Satan from taking advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. So I want to bring attention to that last part, to keep Satan from taking advantage of us. This is talking about forgiving people, so that, because unforgiveness is an open door, and we will talk about that, not right this moment, but we will. So we forgive so that we don't have that open door. But the rest of the scripture says to keep Satan from taking advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. So if we don't learn about his schemes, then we are ignorant of them. That's why we have to learn about them. The Bible makes it clear we have an enemy and that we are in a battle with that enemy and we need to learn about their tactics. Who goes to war of any kind without knowing their enemy? We're told to wear the full armor of God because we're in a war. And that's why we have to know and understand about the enemy. We don't glorify them. We don't focus on them. Do I teach about it a lot? Absolutely. In my personal life, do I focus on it a lot? Nope. I do spiritual warfare every day where I command the enemy to get out, stay, excuse me, get out, stay out, and um, cancel demonic assignments over my life and those things. But I do not focus on the demonic in my life. I focus on God and walking in surrender and walking in the identity and authority he's given me. And I want to I want to caution you because this is something that I think happens a lot when you first start learning about spiritual warfare. It could be really easy to get caught up in demonology and studying each demon and what they do and how they do it, what they look like, how they operate. In my opinion, those things are not important and they're such a slippery slope. I've seen people go off the deep end in that and they get into some really twisted up teaching. They get into focusing on the demonic. The thing that we need to know is how they operate in our life, what they do, and how to stand against them. In my opinion, that's all we need to know. It does not matter. Like I have people reaching out to me all the time. Well, what does this spirit do? What does that spirit do? I, I don't know because I don't study that. They all come to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what John 10, 10 tells us. Every single demon, it says the enemy comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. But Jesus came to give us abundant life. So we know that the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all we need to know. We don't need, in my opinion, now there will be people in deliverance ministry and spiritual warfare that will tell you different. Um, in my opinion, we don't need to study all of that. I think it's a slippery slope, and I think many people get caught up in that web and have a very difficult time getting out of it. So I would caution you, before you go down that, just be careful. So the origins of demons, there's two thoughts behind this. 
Well, actually three. So one is the Nephilim. In Genesis 6, 4, we see it says, There were Nephilim, men of stature, notorious men on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God, which are angels, lived with the daughters of men, and they gave birth to their children. These were mighty men who were of old, men of renown, great reputation and fame. So this, as it goes, there were, there were angels in heaven that saw the men or saw the women on earth and thought they were beautiful. They came and had relations with them and had children, and the children were called Nephilim, and they were giants. A lot of people think that because they were the um, offspring of angels and humans, that when they die physically, that they became demons. The other idea is fallen angels. So we see, let me read a couple of scriptures, Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the age-old serpent who was called the devil and Satan, he who continu continually deceives and seduces the entire inhabited world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Ephesians 6, 12 tells us, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this great darkness, against the spiritual forces of, force, bleh, forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural places. So we know that there are demons. We know that they operate and that Satan is their leader. Some people think that it's from the Nephilim is his demons. Other people think that it's his angels who was um, thrown to heaven with him when he tried to rise and had the uprising against God and he was thrown out of heaven because we know that he had a number of angels that were following him. And some people think it's a mixture of both, that when the Bible talks about principalities and um, the, the different rulers of the darkness, that it's talking about different levels and different rankings of demons and different types and those things. Because we see in the Bible that God had, their, the angels looks different and they had different purposes and different different assignments. So it stands to reason that the demons would be the same way because they're like a twisting and a counterfeit of what, of God's plan. I personally think that they're the fallen angels that fell to earth with Satan. Um, what I think about the Nephilim, I'm kind of on the fence. I, I don't, I don't study it a lot. I don't, well, I'll just put it this way. I don't study it enough to really have a strong opinion. Do I think that they could still be around their, their whatever because they were part human and part angel, fallen angel? Yeah, sure. I mean, the ramifications of that, I couldn't even imagine what they would be. So do I think that they could be demons as well? Yes, I think that they could. I think it could be a mixture of both. And again, to me, it doesn't matter. I, I don't care what they are. I What I care about is the name of Jesus is stronger than them and that they have to respond when we speak the name of Jesus. But I do think that it could be a mixture of both. And I think that they're diabolical and that they hate us and they will do every single thing they can to destroy us. So now I want to talk about the tactics of the enemy. Their plan has always been and will always be to kill, steal, and destroy us. That is their main and only goal. That's all they have to do. So think about all the time that they have had to think up ways to kill, steal, and destroy us. They've been around for a very long time. You know, the little cartoons are kind of cutesy where the devil's like little and he's sitting on the shoulder. And I've even seen where people take their finger and just flick him off and, and like we make fun and we make light of. They're nothing to fear, but they're also nothing to make light of. They are smart and they are crafty and they hate us. We have to be aware of them and we have to be able to stand against them to walk in freedom. They want to separate us from God for eternity. They absolutely hate us and will do everything they can to make sure we don't walk in freedom, peace, and God's joy. So I want to share with you the tactics. So they're subtle and cunning. They try to sneak in a little sin here and there. They try to make it so small that if we're not careful, we may not even catch it that we're slipping into sin. It's like that little temptation just dangling there. And if we're not aware of it, we could take the bait. And it's so small at first. And then the next step is bigger. And then the next step is bigger. And the next step is bigger. You know, I think about people that wake up one day and they've had an affair. It didn't start. Usually it doesn't start with I'm like Christian people who are trying to follow God. They normally don't just 
one day wake up and say, hey, I think I'm going to go have an affair. It starts with a fight with their wife. And then the person at work is so much more understanding than their spouse. Then the person at work gives them so much more attention and they would never treat them that way. Then it's to the quiet lunches when it's just the two of them. Then it's, well, let's just go have um, dinner together at my house and we're just going to talk. It progresses. That's what the enemy does. If we don't catch it, we can end up in sin, like major bondage. And remember, they're smart. They've been doing this for a long time. We shouldn't walk in fear, but we should also not take them lightly. We can't ignore them away or pretend like they don't exist. They are always putting temptation in our path. Always. 2 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He is cunning. Think about what he did to Eve. She walked and talked with God every single day. And one conversation with the devil, she threw it all away, every bit of it, because he twisted the word of God. He didn't even bring in a complete and total lie. He brought in a twisting of God's word. The next thing is they hide in plain sight. They're everywhere, but many times we fail to see them. He doesn't usually come with his horns out and in his full form. And I'm not saying he has horns. That's not what I mean. But that's the depiction that we normally think of, this big hideous horned creature. But the Bible says that he was beautiful, that he was made beautiful. And that's what sin can look like sometimes. He can come and he can dangle that sin in front of us and he can look so beautiful and so appealing and so seductive. If he came in his real form, we would see him from a mile away. He even hides in churches with the agenda of bringing destruction and division. And we don't even see it and we don't even know it most of the time. He's on the prowl always. They're always looking for a place to get into our lives. They never rest. They never stop. They never sleep. They're always looking for a way to trip us up and tempt us. Genesis 4, 7 says, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Like, think about that picture. It's crouching at the door. That means it's ready to jump. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, well-balanced, and self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. That enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. They're always looking for somewhere to devour. They also distort the word of God. They try to confuse our understanding of God, of who we are in him, who he is in us, and his word. He will fill the hearts of many and create false teaching that leads people down the wrong path. False teaching is everywhere. Deception is everywhere. He's filling the hearts of leaders and teachers to create a false doctrine. This could include a refusal to call sin, sin. It could also involve hyper grace that basically says we can live however we want because no matter what we do, our sins are covered. There are many different types of deception. For one, New Age practices. They've been making an appearance in many, many churches. New Age is flowing in and through many churches. And when I say the church, I don't mean one specific denomination. I mean just in general. Not here to pick on any one denomination. In my opinion, every denomination has its own issues and has things that that each one could be working on. Galatians 1, 6 through 8 says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you to the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And we can look at the story of Adam and Eve again. They used the word of God, the enemy, the devil, Satan, Lucifer. He used the word of God, but he twisted it to where it was not accurate anymore. That's why whenever we listen to messages and we follow ministries, we have to be so careful that they are not twisting the word of God and that they're not making it something that it's not supposed to be. 
Deception sometimes comes clothed in seducing spirits that just pull us in. And if we are not walking in discernment and we're not careful, it sounds right, it feels right, and it looks right. I want to encourage you also to make sure that you don't follow people just because they have videos that look like they're doing signs, wonders, miracles, and deliverance. Find out what they preach. What are they preaching and what are they teaching? If that doesn't line up, that other stuff, I would question it. I would greatly, greatly question it. It all goes back to the word of God. Is Are they teaching and preaching the true word of God? The next thing they do is put things in our way to trip us up and tempt us. 2 Timothy 2.26 says, And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Catch that? The snare. A snare is a trap. That's like, um, I watch, I can't remember the name of the show. Oh, it's called Alone. And they drop people into like really rough terrain and they have to build their own own homes and do all that stuff. Well, they will put snares out. And I didn't realize what that was for a long time because I'm not a hunter. I like to fish, but I'm not a hunter. But they will put, it's like little rope or um, like real thin metal. They'll put it out and they'll make it round like that. And then the animal steps in it. And when the animal steps in it, it snares their leg and they're stuck. And then the animal a lot of times dies, especially if it's cold outside. That's the idea of this. The, the devil is putting snares out. And if we aren't careful, we can step into one of his snares. Luke 4, 2 says, For 40 days being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Jesus spent 40 days, and it says he was being tempted by the devil. If the very Son of God went through temptation... The Word become flesh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, He was tempted. How much more are we going to walk through temptation? 1 Thessalonians 3, 5 says, For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor was in vain. There's more scriptures about the devil being a tempter and bringing temptation, but you get the idea. We can see clearly from the Word of God one of their tactics is temptation. So let me go over some, some ways that he can do this. Because I think so many times he brings temptation and we don't even recognize it. We can fall for it so easily. And when I say we, I mean all of us. We have to be on guard against it. We have to watch for it. We have to be prayed up. We have to be wearing our full armor of God because he will bring temptation. Demons will always do that. So one of the ways he, they do this is by sending wrong people into our lives. So this can look like a married person getting convinced that they're supposed to divorce their spouse and go be with somebody else, that God has ordained that, or that God wants them to do that. Or it can just be the wrong person in general. The same way God can send people into our life, the enemy can send them. I have seen so many, and I've seen it more with women just because women, you know, I think connect with other women. So those are the stories I've heard more. I'm sure it happens with males too. I'm, I'm not just picking on you guys. I've heard so many women say that they were positive that this man came into their life and that it was a gift from God. And um, I had one friend myself and I watched some of this unfold and they were just sure he was from God. And as I was hearing the story and, and I got introduced to the situation about midway through. When she looked at him, I saw nothing that she seen. Um, it was not what she felt like it was. Because there was a spirit of sedu seduction wrapped around her, she saw this person as something amazing and wonderful and with all of these attributes. And then other people in her life would look and say, mm, that's not there because it wasn't. It was that the enemy had wrapped him in such a package and she had accepted it. And so she was seeing him as the enemy wanted her to see him. And it was a really sad situation because it, it can go bad really, really fast. And I've seen other women do the exact same thing. They will think, oh, this is exactly who God sent. And then it, it turns out that it was not God who sent them. It was the enemy who sent a person to use for destruction. And that's why we have to be super careful of who we allow in our life, making sure that it's from God. This can be the same with friends. You know, our, our friends group. It matters. It matters who they are. It matters 
what we do, it matters. Are we bringing each other closer to God? Are we pulling each other away from God? My closest circle will never... Now, let me say this because I've been jumped all over for this and saying, oh, you're saying you can't be friends with sinners. That's it, not what I'm saying. I minister to people all the time that are not on fire for God. I minister to people. I would go out and have coffee with them. I would have dinner with them. I would invite them over to my house for ministry. I would never shut somebody out that is not on fire for God at all. But my closest circle, the people that I turn to whenever I need somebody to pray for me and somebody to go to war for me, they're going to be people that I know have a walk with God who are on fire for God. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't have seasons. We all have seasons where we have difficult seasons. I'm just going to put it that way. I get that. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm talking about like my inner circle of who I turn to. I'm not going to go ask godly advice from someone who is not living a godly life. Why would I do that? I'm not going to get godly advice from someone who is not living a godly life. They're going to offer worldly advice at best, or at worst, I should say. If we're seeking out godly advice, we need people who know the Bible. I'm not going to go to someone that I know I need to be held accountable for something I'm doing to someone who will refuse to hold me accountable. I'm just not going to do that. And I'm not going to be that person for other people. If you reach out to me, I'm going to give you the truth. I'm going to give you the biblical truth because that's the only kindness for us to do with each other. If we don't have our circle, our small circle, our support that is doing that for us, we, we need to relook at that and we need to do some adjusting. Because the enemy can use us to pull each other away from God. Lust is another one. So, for example, you can just be driving down the road, not thinking about anything at all. And all of a sudden, like a, a pornography just goes through your mind. Or someone that you shouldn't be thinking about goes through your mind. It could pop up on your phone. You could just be scrolling. I've, I've talked to people who say, I don't even know where these pop-ups come from. I'm just scrolling through my phone and there they are because they're people that struggle with pornography or that are trying to get free from lust. And then all of the pop-ups come. I've had people even say, I put um, controls on my phone. I thought I had this under control. I put all of these different things on here to make sure this didn't happen, but it's still happening. Well, it's because the enemy, he wants you to fall back into lust. Anger is another one. Have you ever had days where just every single thing goes wrong and you feel like you're about to lose your mind and you're cool and you just want to scream? I run into people that have anger issues and I used to be one of them. And the people that struggle with anger the most sometimes have some of the craziest things happen to them. People at the store get rude with them. And I'm talking like all the time. They have people flipping them off. They have people cutting them off in traffic. They have people trying to steal their their um, parking spots. I mean, just over and over and over. It's over the top, over dramatic. It's the enemy more than likely trying to poke and poke and poke and get them to explode and get them in anger. He does that. Right after I went through deliverance, I used to struggle with anger. I used to struggle with blackout rage, like legit blackout rage. Right after I went through deliverance, I had a day where I was driving and it wasn't even a long route, maybe 20 minutes. I was going to be on the road 20 minutes. In that 20 minutes, three people cut me off, like almost took my front end off, cut me off. And I'm like, I see you enemy. I see you trying to get me back in anger. And I knew because of discernment, I knew that it was the enemy trying to draw me back into those patterns of just anger. Another one is trauma. So like cycles of abuse that just go on and on and on. It's almost like you're a magnet for abusive situations. The next is they try to blind us to the truth. So there's times that we just can't see truth. It's like, or you've dealt with someone who just absolutely can't see truth. You can be looking right at them and say, look, the sky is blue. Look at it. And they'll look and they'll say, no, it's green. I see it. I see it's green. And it can be so frustrating because you see the truth. And they can't see it. And sometimes we can feel like, why won't they just open their eyes? But it is like a severe case of denial or just ble being blind. The enemy does this to keep us from seeing the truth that can set us free. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the true gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So we see he does that to unbelievers. 
But I would also say he tries to do that with a bubble. Oh, if I can get that out. He also tries to do that with believers. He tries to get us blinded to the truth. He tries to shield our eyes and our ears so that we don't hear and see truth. The next one is accusations. Satan is continually before God telling him how bad we are, how much we mess up. He's accusing us day and night. His demons also whisper those same accusations in our ears. They tell us how worthless we are, how no one could ever love us. God is mad at us. We'll never um, be better. Life will never get better. We don't deserve better. We should just give up. God will never want us back. We've went too far. We should just run from him on and on and on and on until we recognize that those thoughts are not ours because they sound like our thoughts. They sound like that's, that's our mind, but it's actually demons speaking. I'm not saying it always is, but I'm saying it can be because that's what they sound like. And it can sound to us like us saying, I'm worthless. I'm no good. I'm this, I'm that, but it's because they're putting those thoughts in there. Whenever we talk about weapons of warfare, we're going to talk about how to combat that. Because again, it's not always demonic. I'm saying it could be. And every single one of these, some of these could be our flesh. Some of these could be our emotions. I'm not saying if you are if you deal with any of this, that is 100% demonic. I'm saying this is how it can look. And we need to be on guard for the times that it is demonic. Revelation 10, 12, 10 says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. So he is always accusing. Another thing they do is send false prophetic words to God's people. 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. So whenever we hear a prophetic word, and that can be someone telling us, I have a prophetic word for you, or it can be someone who publicly states the prophetic word that they say is from God. Um, depending on what circles you travel in, you may be exposed to that a lot, or you may not be exposed to it at all. But there are a lot of self-professed prophets out there. And I'm not saying that none of them are from God. I do believe that God speaks prophetically to his people. Um, I do believe that there's a gift of prophecy, 100%. But I also believe it is misused, and I believe it is abused, and I believe that the enemy wreaks havoc in that area. So the different sources for a prophetic word are either God, the person speaking, or demons, or a mixture. So that can look like someone feels and feels that this is what God wants them to say. And unbeknownst to them, they're just speaking out of their self. They're not speaking for God anymore. I recently had someone message me and say, um, God told me that this, 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 and this. And I'm like, no, God didn't tell you that for me because that's not me. It was something very specific, something I'm not dealing with at all. I'm not in denial about it. Like it was something very obvious. I would have known immediately. And well, am I, it wasn't even a thing where I'd say, well, am I dealing with that or not? It was, it was a very obvious, no, I'm not dealing with that. And um, so I knew like, n no, that's not a message from God for me. There's been other times that people have spoken things over me and I'm like, that's not me. I just, sometimes I just know in my spirit. Other times it's like, it just misses the mark. I remember one time I was in a service and I saw this, this man, he was given um, out prophetic words just to anybody who wanted them, um, which is a unique thing. But anyway, he was, he was lining people up and just giving out words. And he talked to this one woman and he said, um, your house just burnt down and you're walking through this, this, and this. And she was like, no, you know, my house didn't burn down. And then he backtracked and he said, well, maybe it's spiritually, you know, it felt like he was trying to talk her into why he was accurate. He was missing the mark. And instead of just saying, I'm sorry, I missed it. He was trying to manipulate her into accepting what he was saying. And, um, I think it's abused like that a lot. I also know that there's times that demons speak through people. So I'll give you an example of that. I follow, I don't follow, he's passed away now, but I read a lot of Derek Prince's books. And it was in one of his books he was talking, and I don't remember which one. He was talking about he was at a service 
and I think service was over and a woman came up to him and she said, Oh, Derek, I just got to talk to you. The Lord gave me a vision and you are going to, you, you need to get your life in order. You need to make sure you have all of your, your, um, funeral planned and your wife's taken care of because within such amount of time, you're going to wreck, you're going to hit a tree and you're going to die. And the Lord told me to tell you this so that you can get your life in order. He's being so gracious so you can get your life together. And after that was spoken to him, he just knew in his spirit, like, that's not from God. And he rebuked it in the name of Jesus. And he's like, that's a demonic attack. And he said in the book or a video, I can't remember which one, had he accepted that, he fully believes he would have had a crash. Now, whether or not God would have spared his life, that's a different thing because his days were in God's hands. But if he had accepted that lie as truth, he thinks it would have come to pass. And he went on to talk about how that's many times what happens with psychics. You go to them and they tell you what's going to happen. And you leave and there's a demon attached to you with an assignment to make that thing happen so that it looks like it's real because it's not that it knew the future. It knew what it was going to create in your life. And then it does. And then it happens. And then you're like, oh my goodness, they knew exactly what was going to happen. No, there was a demon attached to make it happen. The same thing can happen in the church with prophetic words when there are demons present. And then it also can be from God. That's why we have to test everything. Sometimes pe the people giving the word fully feel that God has given them the message. But in fact, he's not the source and they don't even know it. So I'm not saying that all of these people are false prophets and that they know they're false prophets. Some people are and they have no idea. And some people are legitimate. Like I've had people give me very specific things that were spot on and I knew they were from God because they were confirming something he'd already told me. So I want to give you a little snippet here real quick. So when someone gives you a... a prophetic word, here's what we should do. Number one, ask yourself if it lines up with the word of God. Is it accurate with his word? If it goes against his word, disregard it immediately. Next, if it does line up with, the, with God's word, move on to the next question. Does it confirm what God has already been speaking to you? If it doesn't, ask him to confirm it. Ask him if it's from him to please give you confirm it, to confirm that it's from him. Confirmation, sorry. The next is, how does it feel in your discernment? Discernment-wise, does it feel off? Do you feel a red flag? Do you feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, mm-mm? Or do you feel peace about it? If it lines up with God's word and he's using it for confirmation, then you can accept it. If it does not line up, discard it immediately. Do not come into agreement with it. If you're not sure, if you're not sure where it lines up, file it away and continue praying on it. Continue asking God to confirm it. But don't come in an agreement with it until you know it's him. And what I mean by that, if someone gives you a prophetic word, don't automatically say, thank you, that's for me. That's mine. I claim that. Yes, I agree with that. Yes. Don't do that until you know it's from God. The next thing is false teaching. And I kind of already hit on this, um, but I want to talk about it a little bit more. So many churches today are teaching a lukewarm, watered-down gospel that is really missing the mark. Um, everything does not go. Everything is not okay. God is a holy God. We are required to live biblical lives. And so many times we depend overly on grace and never consider changing sinful habits because churches aren't teaching to do that. So we have to be really careful, and I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go into that deep. It's really been on my heart because I run into it all the time. I think because of just social media, people reaching out to me, I, I run into false teaching all the time. Um, I have people tell me that I'm not really saved. Some of the reasons I say I'm not saved is because I teach, and I teach in an arena where men can hear. So because of that, I'm not saved. I've been called a Jezebel spirit because I teach where men can hear me. Um, I've also been told that I'm not saved because I use the English pronunciation of the name Jesus instead of Yeshua, which I do use Yeshua too. I use them both. I think that Jesus is just the English translation. And whenever I do deliverance ministry, the demons flee at the name of Jesus. But that's neither here nor there. I've also been told that I'm not um, saved because I'm thinking of, oh, because I think that Christians can have demons and have the need to have them cast out. Um, I've been told I'm not saved because I teach too much about spiritual warfare. I've been told that I'm not saved because, excuse me, I um, believe that 
I believe in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that they're three in one, but that they each function differently. I've been told that I am not saved because I don't believe in once saved, always saved. I believe that we can walk away from God and break covenant with him. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. But all of it is, there's so much out there. There is so much out there. There is a denomination and then a split and a split and a split. You can find somebody that believes everything. And um, there's so many accusations, so much fighting. So yeah. First Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit expressively says in the latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Some people use that and say that that scripture means we're not supposed to teach about demons. I do not agree with that at all. I believe that that's false teaching, deceitful spirits and teaching of demons, teachings of demons. I think that that's all of the false um, messages that are being taught. So the next one is they twist the word of God and cause confusion. It goes along with false teaching, but they twist it just enough to create confusion and they make it very hard to detect. God is not a God of confusion. If we are constantly confused, there's something wrong. Genesis 3, 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you should not eat of the tree of the garden? He's trying to get her to doubt what God said. They also twist our words. So think about this. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and they said you said something that you never said? You say one thing, but they hear it a completely and different way. The enemy loves to cause division and confusion in relationships, churches, and communities. It's like where you just cannot get on the same page. You say one thing and they hear another. Or maybe you're the one that does that. They say one thing and you hear another because the enemy is twisting words. They also perform fake signs, wonders, and miracles. So we see in Exodus chapter 7 and 8 that Moses was performing miracles by the power of God and the Pharaoh's magi magicians did some of the exact same mir miracles, but they were not using the power of God. The same is true today. Everything labeled as an outpouring and work of the Holy Spirit is not always the work of the Holy Spirit. Something can feel good, like you can be in your emotions and it can feel good and look good, but not be the Holy Spirit at all. That's why we can't accept it based on um, what it looks like. We have to be more than just in our feelings and emotions. Feelings and emotions can lie, but the word of God will never lie or never fail. We must test everything with the word of God. Revelation 16, 14 says, For there they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. So we know that there is a counterfeit for everything that God does. We can see it in the word. We know that that's what the enemy tries to do. Counterfeit everything and twist it, defile it. And so... I can remember, and I talk about this a lot, coming up in um, very spirit-filled churches. And we were taught, and you know, looking back, I don't know, was it said? Was it just inferred? But we were basically taught to question things would be to quench the Holy Spirit. And you didn't want to quench him. You wanted him to come in and have his way and do whatever he wanted. But because of that, we basically accepted everything. We had ministers come in. We had all kinds of things come in and we were never taught, okay, this is how you line it up. Does, does this line up with the word of God? Is this a move of the Holy Spirit? Is this him actually manifesting in our services? Is this something else? Is it demons? I've watched videos of where I know in a church service, it's demons manifesting because I can see it. I discern it. I feel it. I recognize it. And people are jumping up and down praising God thinking it's the Holy Spirit. So I know it happens. I've seen it. I've been in some of it. And that's why we have to be so careful and go beyond what does it feel like. Because think about this. You can go to a concert, a music concert, and it can feel really good. I can remember going to concerts back in the day. And it would be like an emotional high and it would feel so good. And then I can remember going into church services and having that exact same high and it feeling that exact same way. And that's why we have to go way beyond feeling and say, is this God? Is this really the Holy Spirit? 
And does it line up with the fruit of the Spirit? One of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, gentleness, kindness. Does it line up with who he is? If it doesn't line up with his character and his fruit, it's not going to be him. And I'm not saying God doesn't move. He absolutely does. He moves upon his people. There have been times that I've been in his presence and his presence is so strong. I can't stand to my feet. I have to like bow down because I just feel that awe and that reverence and that heaviness of his presence. I know that there's times that it, that he's there and that things happen, miracles, signs, and wonders that they happen. Absolutely. But I've also been in places where they've been, have been manufactured. And it's really hard to tell the difference. Before I went through deliverance and before I started walking in more discernment by praying for more discernment, it was really hard to tell the difference. And if we're just going by feeling and just what it looks like, we can get we can get fooled. They also use manipulation. They will try their best to manipulate people in situations to bring harm to as many people as possible. The next one is distractions. The list of distractions could go on and on and on. We are all so busy in our lives, with our jobs, our families, our hobbies, social media, entertainment, TV, reading, all of it. Busy. The second we go to pray or pick up our Bibles, the phone rings, someone stops by, the kids start crying, we start thinking about millions of things we need to do. Think about this. We can easily binge watch our favorite show for hours, but fall asleep five minutes after we start praying or reading the Bible. Like, why is that? It's because the enemy does not want us reading the Bible or praying. They also can steal the word of God or try to steal the word of God. And this can come in many different ways. For one, try, like memori- trying to memorize the word of God. And it's like it just, you it doesn't stick. You just, for whatever reason, you cannot memorize it. That could be demonic. And understanding what it means or having the ability to apply it to your life. Matthew 13, 19 says, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. So we see that the enemy tries to come and steal it out of our mind and just take it. I can remember before I went through deliverance, I would get the Bible out and I just would be so tired. I wouldn't want to read it. Sometimes I just didn't get it. It was the last thing I wanted to do. And all of the things would start running through my mind that I needed to do. Thousands of things. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need more time for this. I need more time for that. It was like I never had time for the word because there was always something else to be doing. And now I see, oh my goodness, that was so demonic. I run into people all the time too that say they just can't understand it. And when you start praying, and I'm getting into a little bit of the the weapons of warfare, but when you start praying before you read it and commanding every enemy to be silent and to leave, it helps a lot. So the next thing is he makes trades. So think about this. He even tried to trade with Jesus, and he's constantly trying to do the same thing with us. Matthew 4, 9, it says, And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. So it was a trade. Give me this, and I'll give you that. Think about what he said. All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Makes you wonder how many famous people have made that trade. Because doesn't that sound familiar? I will give you everything. If you just bow down and worship me. And if he said it to Jesus, we can be sure he's trying to say it to us and everybody else. I've heard countless stories of people in Hollywood who have come out and said that they've sold their soul to the devil or they've made trades with the devil and then they got famous. And I believe that. I know some people say, oh, that's just conspiracy theory. That's just that. That's how the enemy operates. Why why would it not still be true? The next is deception. Revelation 9, 12, 9 says, And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Revelation twenty ten says, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire, and the sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. So they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Galatians 3, 1 and 2 says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So this verse shows why we have to be so careful of what we're listening to. Deception is running rampant. The next is dominating and controlling. They want to control and dominate our lives. So it usually starts out by trying to dominate our thought life. 
They try to take over our mind. If they can get control of that, they have us right where we want us and that's in bondage. So think about that. Does your mind belong to you? Are you in control of the thoughts that go through your head? Or do you feel like you're constantly being bombarded and attacked? If you are being constantly bombarded and attacked, where are those attacks coming from? The next one is compulsions. So once he controls us, he uses compulsions to draw us into sin. It can feel like we're doing everything possible to avoid a specific sin or sins, but also it can feel like we don't have the ability to stop. So I'm not saying that we lose control because as a Christian, we cannot be possessed by a devil. We cannot be possessed by any demon. We can be oppressed and we can be demonized and we can be harassed, but we cannot be possessed. But what I'm talking about is when you feel like you are doing everything possible to, to walk in freedom from that specific sin and you're going about life and you're doing it and then all of a sudden you are bam right back there in it. You are like, like it just comes right back there to you and it is like it just blows up in your face like a big kaboom and you're right back there again. That's what I'm talking about where it seems like you are constantly drawn to it. You can't get away from it. There's a compulsion there. There's a drawing. There's a, um, it's like unnatural. You can just feel it and you don't understand it. You want away from it. You want to do better. But it's like there's just something in you driving you to it. That can most of the time be demonic. So they also hide in dark places. They love to give nightmares and they love to stay hidden. So many times they are so hidden in the churches, they're sitting on the front pew winking at the pastor and the pastor has no idea. We get so shocked when the members and the pastor get caught up in sin, but it's because we don't recognize when the enemy walks us through the front door. The same can be true for our, our homes. If we don't learn to recognize, we will never stand against them. They also create fear. It could be fear of the past, present, future, dying, fear of losing salvation, fear of the dark, fear of sickness. The list goes on and on and on. I should, well, I, I should look up how many phobias there are now. I've looked it up before and there are so many fears and phobias. The list is just, there's a fear or a phobia of everything that I could think of. There's so many of them. The spirits of fear are real and they will try to get us in bondage. They can also cause physical and mental illness. Job 2, 7 says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. I'm not saying all physical and mental illness is demonically um, driven, but it can be. They also lie. Lie, lie, and lie. John 8, 44 says, You are of your father the devil, and you, your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. They lie constantly. That's why it does no good to try to figure them out, to try to, they just lie, they lie. So many times he whispers a lie to us. So it could come really easily and it could be something about our character, about God, about who we are in him, who he is in us. It could be so simple. God doesn't love you. That simple. God doesn't love you. And here's what happens. We, we hear it and then we start thinking about it. Well, I have messed up a lot. I wonder if that means that I went too far and God just can't forgive me. I wonder if that means that God is just done with me. So we're dwelling on it. We're analyzing it. Then we start to believe it. You know what? I wouldn't love me. I wouldn't care about me. So maybe God doesn't. I, I don't think God loves me anymore. Then we start speaking the lie. God doesn't love me. He just, he just doesn't love me. That's where the bondage is created. We dwell on it. So the lie is whispered, we dwell on it, we start believing it, and then we speak it. And then it becomes our truth. That can be about us, you know, being worthless. It can be about our situations never changing. It can be about us being sick. It can be about us, you name it, it, it can fall under that. 
They also love to bring condemnation disguised as conviction. Condemnation beats us up and makes us run and hide from God. Real conviction drive, draws us to, toward God to get the issues dealt with. I'm almost done. I was trying to keep this at an hour. They also love to bring up our past. Many times they do this by getting us fixated on past situations and choices. They play the movie. Sometimes it can look like a movie and we can see the situation or we hear it or, or whatever. It plays over in our head over and over, trying to get us to rethink our choices and questions. If we'd have said this differently or if we'd done that differently, maybe the outcome would be different. This can lead to bondages of shame, doubt, grief, and regret. We can easily get stuck in the what ifs. We can get caught up in a fantasy world because we're always playing life out in our head of what if it looks like this? What if it looks like that? They can also get us stuck in looking back at the good old days. If we're constantly looking back, we're never going to move forward. If we got our heads turned backwards, we're not going straight ahead. We have to heal and let go of our past and we have to move forward from it. We can't analyze it. We can't sit with it. We can't continually go over and over it. There's sometimes we just have to say, no, I'm not going back there in the name of Jesus. I am free from that and I am going forward. They also bring distorted thought patterns, which can come in the form of confusion, brain fog, and the inability to see reality. They also create chaos, which that can be in our environment. They will often create one crisis after the next, after the next, after the next to keep us constantly in chaos and off of like our game and in confusion and in fear of what's going to happen next. They also can masquerade as the Holy Spirit. So I've cast out several demons when I was doing deliverance ministry that said they pretended to be the Holy Spirit. And whenever I asked the people after the, de the deliverance, I said, did you recognize that? And they've all said, no, when I was in the midst of it, I thought that was the Holy Spirit, but I lived a life of massive confusion because I never understood why the Holy Spirit would tell me to do some of the things it said to do. And it made so much sense to me because I've heard people say that God has told them to do things that I know contradict his word, but they're convinced that the enemy or that God is using that or situation or that he's telling them to do something and that it's clearly against his word, but they're convinced it's him because they feel like they can hear the voice of God and they know his voice. But what happened, it was a demon masquerading as the voice of the Holy Spirit. And so they've misjudged it and thought that it was the Holy Spirit and it keeps them in confusion. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen says, and no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of the light. The next thing is they put us in bondage. Luke 13, 16 says, And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? They are always looking for ways to create legal rights in our lives that lead to bondage and allow them to set up residence in our lives and to create strongholds, to keep us in bondage and in torment. Because remember, John 10, 10 says, The thief comes only to kill, to steal, and to destroy us. That's all they want. That's it. They have no other um, agenda whatsoever. And so that's why we have to recognize what they are doing when it's them. But we also have to recognize our flesh as well. And we're going to talk about that. Not tonight. But we're going to talk about that. Because we can't blame everything on a demon and say, well, it's that because it's a demonic. It's that because I'm being attacked. We have our responsibility and I guarantee if you have a demon issue, they're going to be playing on your flesh. So there's more than likely a flesh issue as well. And so we have to address that and not just blame everything on the demonic, but we also need to be in balance because we can't say, well, everything's the flesh and there's no demons. It's both. We deal with the demonic and we deal with the flesh. So that's it for tonight. I hope this has been helpful. Next week, we're going to get into weapons of warfare. Um, if you guys feel so led, I am always accepting donations or offerings for Fullness of Joy Ministry, and it's posted in the group how you can donate, but on Zelle, I do Fullness of Joy Ministry at gmail.com, PayPal is Fullness of Joy Ministry at gmail.com, Venmo is at Nicole slash Henson slash, or dash, I guess that's a dash, dash Henson dash ministry. Um, this is a free workshop. Most of everything that I do is free except for the books that I sell. And I try to keep them at the lowest possible price so that everybody can 
can get a hold of them that that wants to but we do appreciate donations it just allows us to put on more con put out more content and and those types of things so you guys be blessed i will see you kind of in person on thursday because we'll do our video then our live video bye bye